So the food fight continues. Um, I always say people fight more about food than politics or religion. And I made a couple comments about gluten and the brain and wow, um, you guys are really attached to gluten. <laughs> so I have a very special guest today, <clears throat> someone who is my mentor and um, a friend. And I'm super excited to have him on with us because he's an expert in this field. Um, so I am going to see if I can invite Dr. Perlmutter. Um, let's see here. Oh, there he is. Okay, Dr. Perlmutter is there. Let me see if I can invite him. Uh, and of course, I'm trying to figure. I see you, Dr. Perlmutter. I'm just trying to figure out. Um, uh, okay. That didn't work. Uh, I know I can do this. Hold on. I put my glasses on. Okay, let's see here. Let me add you. Why can't I add? There we go. There we go. Okay. All right, so let's see. I'm waiting for Dr. Perlmutter to come on, and hopefully he just got my request. And there he there is. There you are. Hi, how are you? Just wonderful. How are you? Welcome to Florida. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, I'm actually not quite there yet, but I'm I know, but I know I'm welcoming you in advance. Oh, yes. Thank you. I love it so much. It's one of my favorite places. So super excited that we have our clinic there. Um, yes, you are in a beautiful spot. So I want to thank you so much for joining. And before we go too far, I do. I think you don't need much introduction, <laughs> but just in case, um, I do want people to know who you are. Um, Dr. Perlmutter, besides being a dear friend of ours and one of my just top mentors, um, he's a board certified neurologist, six times New York Times bestselling author, serves on the board of the directors and is a fellow of the American College of Nutrition, um, serves as a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. Um, his books have been published in 32 languages, including the number one New York Times bestseller, Grain Brain, which is why I have you here today. Um, and he's the editor of The Microbiome and the Brain, authored by top experts in the field. Um, and I'm super excited. Your new book, which we hopefully can talk about a little bit at the end, Drop Acid, is just a great book. Um, that is about the, the pivotal role of uric acid in metabolic diseases. Um, so you just are so busy in this field. And how all things related to brain, um, much like we do, but in a, different, in a different way. And I love your focus on nutrition. So I'm super excited that you're here with me today. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for having me. Always great to see you. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because as you, as you recount those areas of interest and then the books that came out of those areas of interest, it's, it's been very intriguing to me how lack of... Uh, how non-disparate they really are. You know, back in 2013 with Grain Brain, we talked about that, the fact that uh, a highly refined carbohydrate diet is threatening towards brain health uh, and really towards all manner of chronic degenerative disease. And now here we are, 2022, we published a book uh, about uric acid, but it focuses on the same thing, that refined carbohydrates and especially fructose can elevate a media a mediary in this case uric acid that leads to the same fundamental mechanisms that threaten brain health in other words inflammation and the action of chemicals called free radicals it all comes together and between those two again seemingly disparate works was a brain maker that looked at the role of the gut bacteria in terms of keeping inflammation at bay keeping good nutrition for the brain. And interestingly, as I was waiting to come on today, I was uh, looking at uh, you and Dan have uh, put out uh, several uh, posts about serotonin as of late, it's been kind of a focus. And interestingly, we know that this mechanism ser uh, that creates serotonin, the mechanism of inflammation, threatens our ability to actually manufacture, create, the serotonin that we need for all the things that you and your husband have been talking about and uh, does so by threatening our ability to convert the amino acid tryptophan into serotonin and instead diverts it to forming something called kynurenic acid. So that relates 
all the things you were talking about with respect to serotonin, the focus, the joy, the happiness, the contentedness, all of that stuff relates back to inflammation. And that mm -hmm. takes us back to the fundamental role of the gut bacteria. And even further back in time, way back to grain brain, uh, in terms of how this protein, gluten, uh, can uh, affect the gut, can affect gut permeability, can therefore lead to increased inflammation and affect our biochemistry, our neurochemistry, if you will. Right. And now tell me if I'm wrong on this, because I think it's fair to say you are, I mean, you sold a million, the, the Grain Brain sold well over a million copies. Um, I don't even know how many copies now. I, I know I know it's well over a million copies. Um, and you're, I think it's fair to say you are probably America's neurologist. I mean, you're, you're just, you are top in your field. And so oh, that's God. why I'm so privileged to have you here. Thank you, my goodness. Today. And it's, um, it's why I've followed you for so long. And I remember the day I had come, I've taken several hundred hours of um, courses in metabolic medicine at A4M and, you know, at IFM and all these different um, places because I was trying to heal myself. And when I had the privilege of taking some of your courses, I remember coming home and this is way back. I was one of the early adopters, you know, when some of the studies were coming out about gluten and I came home and cause I was really sick as a kid. And so I came home and I threw all the bread away and I threw all the gluten away. And, and I remember, um, you know, Daniel came home at that time and he's like, gluten is not of the devil. And then he became friends with you. <laughs> and suddenly he comes home and he's like, gluten is of the devil. <laughs> it of was the really devil. Funny. So, uh, so it was just a very funny conversation. And, th and then we've all become friends since then. And, and it's just been, it's been great. But um, I made some, I had a post recently, what prompted this um, live chat. I posted something about gluten and gut permeability and what affects your gut affects your brain. And I talked about, you know, permeability of the blood brain barrier and people went crazy. First of all, I often say people fight more about food than politics or religion. And anytime I post something about bread, it's people literally have a religious attachment to bread. It's like Jesus right. ate bread. I hear this all the time. It's so funny. Um, so they get really angry. Um, and I mean, I had people posting comments, you know, like, this is a lie. And you guys, you know, you need gluten, you need bread, you need grains. Um, and it's just, it's, they get really attached. Yeah. And, so, and I think that grains are a good food choice. So let's be clear. Um, you know, the, the reason we called the book Grain Brain is to make sure people understood that there were good and bad grains. Uh, but we want to really steer people away from the gluten containing grains, right. uh, wheat, wheat, barley, and rye. Uh, because, you know, frankly, w there's plenty of good science behind that. But when you say that we are counter to give us this day our daily bread, man, that ruffles a lot of feathers. I hear you. <laughs> and, and the reality is there are breads that you can eat. There are rice breads and other types of non-gluten containing uh, grains that are used to make bread. So I think we have to be a little bit more specific. The other thing that I think is really very important is you can walk down the gluten-free aisle in your grocery store and see the most horrendous foods that are threatening, not because they contain gluten, now they do not, but because they are really uh, highly processed carbohydrates and in starch. the cake. Yeah, the cakes, the cookies, the, the dough, the batters, whatever, the pasta, you name it. And it still threatens us because it will threaten our insulin sensitivity and will also drive up our endogenous production of fructose in the human body. And that becomes an issue because the downstream metabolite of fructose is uric acid, which mm -hmm. is significant. Uric acid is telling our metabolism basically prepare for winter. Mm -hmm. Slow down our metabolism, reduce our energy usage, make fat and store fat, lock it up, make our bodies insulin resistant because that has been until quite recently a powerful survival mechanism to target the production of uric acid by getting a little fructose in the diet in the late summer when we would find berries. But now we're targeting that pathway day in and day out, amplifying uric acid production and increasing that mechanism, inflammation, just like we did with gluten by increasing gut permeability. And you know, gluten actually enhances production of inflammatory chemicals in and of itself as well. 
So the notion that it increases gut permeability and increases blood brain barrier permeability, that's really bona fide Harvard research published in a peer reviewed journal on multiple occasions that makes it very clear that that is a mechanism. Uh, and there's nothing really good about that. We do not need gluten. Thank there was you. One, yeah, there was one interesting article that was published several years ago now that showed uh, increased risk of cardiovascular disease in people who were on a gluten-free diet. But these were people who restricted all grains. And when you <laughs> restrict all grains, you're reducing your fiber consumption. That's not going to be good for anybody. So uh, if, if there is no need in the human diet for gluten. There's also no need in the human diet for any sugar whatsoever. There's no requirement. We make the sugar that, <clears throat> that we need. We can manufacture glucose. We make glucose when we break down starch, for example. We make fructose, for crying out loud, uh, which is something we want to try to reduce. But uh, because of the downstream consequence of fructose in human physiology is uric acid. Again, mm -hmm. a danger signal uh, that winter is coming. We better make a lot of fat and become insulin resistant. The point I'm making is that for our ancestors, becoming insulin resistant and gaining body fat was a wonderful thing. It allowed them to survive during times of caloric scarcity. Well, we don't experience that anymore. Yeah. No, I, I, I love what you just said. And I thank you for um, bringing up the research. Um, I, you know, I'm, I, when I get these comments on my page, I try to quickly post the research, but there's too much. And so I thought, you know, no, what no, is yeah, I, I hear you. I, I take a deep breath and smile. Um, there's an, uh, there's an old saying, God forgive them for they know not what they do, <laughs> know not what they say, or no, not God forgive them because they know not what they post. I don't know, or I what they do not know. Right. Yeah, exactly. They, there's a bit of a pair. I, I generally don't engage because it, it generally leads to worse and worse confrontation. I mean, um, you know, I, I look at some of the posts, uh, negative posts about my books, et cetera, and that's okay because, you know, it's really good because if we weren't challenging the mainstream and challenging the status quo, then the ball would not move down the field. So we've got to have outliers to challenge the status quo. Ronald Reagan fam famously said that the term status quo is a Latin term, meaning the mess we're in. So we've got to challenge the status quo, that. recognizing that, for example, spec scan is a very uh, a very viable and useful tool in understanding how well a person's brain is working or not and following it over time in terms of your intervention you know ha has that been criticized of course it has been have people said no we should eat all the sugar we want and you know yeah. mutter, what does he know about gluten that's fine i'm oh. i'm i'm totally I but if we can know, if I, we can help a few people then it's worth it right that's so. right and not define ourselves based on the comments of others. Yep, exactly. So I love that you brought that up. Um, so people want to know, um, a couple of the questions were, um, isn't gluten good for some people? And you already answered that. You said, no, no, it doesn't serve a purpose in our diet. The number of people who need gluten in their diets it, on the planet is zero. So I don't okay. think I could be more definitive than that. Now that doesn't <laughs> mean that it's a good idea to go grain free. Okay. That's not necessarily a good idea. There are plenty of uh, under-processed, gluten-free grains that are out there. And we need grain uh, if, as a source of fiber. We can probably do without it, but uh, I would say that for most people, you, using grains is a reasonable idea. And if you are getting enough fiber in, with your greens or if you're adding... Um, if you are adding fiber to smoothies, is that sufficient? It depends. I don't know how much a person's adding. Uh, it's been estimated that our hunter-gatherer forebears would consume somewhere north of 100 grams of fiber oh, a wow. day. And the reason wow. we're able to determine this, we, we have some really good metrics in terms of the diets of our hunter-gatherer forebears from two, uh, from two sources. First, we're able to analyze the fossilized poop, if you will, that has been see, uh, recovered with the uh, bone, fossilized bones of our ancestors and determine what their diets were like. We can also look at the wear patterns on their teeth and determine that they were eating a lot of fiber. And then when we analyze the diets of 
uh, various populations that are living even today that are, are pretty much um, you know, non, non-developed uh, cultures, they tend to eat an awful lot of fiber. I mean, we have this sense that our hunter-gatherer forebears went around all the time and killed mastodons and basically were totally carnivorous. Well, not, not, that's not what the science tells us. We, the term hunter-gatherer means, yeah, you might hunt, but you also gather. You gather a lot of tubers and a lot of vegetables and things that you find. So, you know, I wish that uh, we could consider fiber to be one of the, you know, the top three uh, food groups, but mm-hmm. unfortunately, uh, it is a carbohydrate. So it's grouped in, the, in, you know, the macronutrients of carbohydrate. The others are fat and protein. We can't segregate it out, but it's so darn important. Now, most right. people living in Western cultures are getting about 15 grams as opposed to the 100 grams of fiber in their diets a day, and it's nowhere near enough. So, uh, I think supplementing is a good idea. Targeting uh, the supplementation of fiber using what's called prebiotic fiber. Right. I, think I learned that from you. Yeah, well, the main thing we want fiber for uh, a couple of things. It helps keep fluid balance in the gut, keeping our mm-hmm. bowel movements good. But I think more importantly, fundamentally, it nurtures our gut bacteria. And we have come to realize how important that is uh, these days. Uh, like never before. I mean, to be so humbled by these microscopic critters that live in our gut and to realize, you know, they are holding the sword of Damocles, determining whether we live or die, we sure as heck better do everything we can to be kind to our little friends. Right, right. I used to have my daughter name them when she was little because she's like, what do you mean I have bugs in my gut? And I'm like, they're like pets. You have to take care of them. <laughs> so we named them Lace and Biffy. Or, or Biff, no, uh, Biff and Lacey. <laughs> Um, so we just, we named them and she'd have to feed them. And yeah, it was very funny. If he has um, a bacteria. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so that was one of the questions. Um, someone asked if you could develop gluten allergies over time. Yeah, the answer is yes. And we've seen that. Um, I would say more likely we're going to want to talk about gluten sensitivity. The real oh. allergy in this discussion is called a wheat allergy very well defined that people have, they develop antibodies, you can test those and see them uh, to wheat. Uh, What people tend to develop over time would be more of a gluten sensitivity, such that they have many of the downsides of gluten exposure without having an autoimmune condition that's called celiac disease that truly only affects about 2.8 to 3% of the American population. Whereas we don't know how many people are gluten sensitive. Uh, The idea of non-celiac gluten sensitivity published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, I might add, uh, may affect as many as 40% of individuals. And these are individuals who get uh, clinical manifestations upon gluten consumption, that is a totally different mechanism, there you go, uh, than uh, celiac disease. So it's not an autoimmune event related to the small intestinal lining, uh, but rather uh, it's a reaction to gluten that can lead to cognitive issues, neurological issues, uh, memory issues, mood issues, importantly, movement disorders, uh, headache, joint pain, skin issues, etc. Very well defined. So this, and you just touched on something. So this is why when people go on and on about bread and Jesus ate bread, and um, I'm like, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that we weren't adding all of the things to, that Jesus wasn't adding all the things to bread back then and Monsanto wasn't around. Um, we, we'd adulterate our food so much now. I mean, tell me, please tell me if I'm wrong, but I think that, you know, the food that we eat now is so different from the food that we ate, um, you know, 2000 years ago. Um, or longer. And it's um, just the fact that you said, like, even what you were talking about, we have such an abundance of food now compared to having to work for our food or work for our daily bread in the past, that it's just changed everything with our bodies. Well, you know, that's an interesting concept, but uh, I'm, with all due respect, uh, may challenge it a little bit, because I think the amount of work that we have to do as humans uh, now uh, or when agriculture first came around, when that was, I don't know, twelve to 14,000 years ago, that the reality is that our hunter-gatherer forebears who weren't involved in agriculture actually didn't spend uh, as much time in the creation of their food stores as 
happened once agriculture and we became bound to the plowshare. Uh, once that happened, you know, we, we needed to create this abundance of food to create our food stores, use food as a metric uh, for a trade, uh, et cetera, and food had longer uh, shelf life, if you will, uh, than when we simply were hunting and gathering. And it, it turns out that, you know, we have this notion that our hunter-gatherer forebears were always doing that. Well, probably that wasn't true. But you know, your other comment, your first comment, that food is different than it was even 100 years ago, that's for darn sure. And so that really raises this notion of evolutionary environmental mismatch, mm. where our bodies, our physiology, as dictated by our genes, our DNA, uh, has evolved under a pretty non-changing set of circumstances. Suddenly, we com uh, confront our bodies, our physiology, uh, with a, a, a number of chemicals and change in the overall uh, composition of our diets quickly to the extent that we can't uh, adapt. We don't have the ability to to change uh, in terms of our physiology over time uh, to be responsive and still remain healthy in the face of these new environmental challenges. When I say environmental, yes, our outward environment, but also that includes our uh, the, the foods that we are consuming, the sleep that we are getting or not, the, the stresses of our, our modern lives. I wrote about this first, this environmental evolutionary mismatch mm -hmm. Uh, in an article in the Miami Herald that I published half a century ago, uh, when I was uh, 16, I guess, or 17, um, and I, I just said, you know, what about us living today with this outdated machinery? Right. And by the outdated machinery, I was describing what you are getting at, the fact that, you know, our bodies are just not up to the task in terms of dealing with the incredible number of new chemicals that are introduced annually into the country that... Uh, into our foodstuffs that have never really been formally tested. Uh, and beyond that, just the overall shift in the makeup of the diet, the incredible amount of refined carbohydrates. And as you and I talked about earlier, importantly, this dramatic reduction in fiber consumption that we've experienced that is having profound effects in terms of chronic degenerative conditions. Mm. Yeah, no, it's so interesting. Um... So uh, let's see, we already answered that one. So someone asked you, I think you already answered this. How does gluten affect the brain? You pretty much answered that. It's the inflammation and then goes on from there. Um, does it affect all people in the same way? I think you pretty much touched on that. It just, there's no need for it. I mean, obviously if you have celiac, I think it's different than if you are non-celiac and you have a sensitivity to it, correct? Night and day. I mean, okay. uh, at the end of the day, both both groups need to avoid gluten, but certainly uh, individuals with celiac disease, totally different mechanism, uh, but uh, they're, you know, ex exquisitely sensitive to gluten, far more so than uh, individuals who have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So there's That's... like a continuum. So it yeah. affects people differently, but it's not necessary for anyone. Is essentially it's not right. necessary. It's not required for anyone. That's for sure. So, and then someone asked, I think you sort of asked this one, does it decrease serotonin? Um, so you touched on that. Um, so when you say it decrease, when we talk about decreasing serotonin, the, the gut brain connection, I guess, is um, we talked about inflammation, um, permeability. Um, so when you, anything that affects the gut is going to affect the brain and the brain function. Um, but someone's asking specifically about serotonin and, and you kind of touched on that. Um, do you have anything else to say about serotonin and how gluten might affect that? Well, I think as you, uh, you and Daniel uh, made very clear, it's really in our interest to maintain uh, good levels of this neurotransmitter serotonin. Uh, that, uh, you know, a lot of which is derived from the gut. Uh, you know, the lion's share, uh, actually, is coming from the gut. Isn't it like 80 so to 90 percent? Pardon me? Isn't it like 80 to 90 percent? It, it's north of 90 percent. Some yeah. is actually manufactured uh, in the platelets. Uh, that's the other big resource for serotonin uh, production. So, and, and, you know, by and large, this is a something that our gut bacteria are intimately involved in. And whenever we change their environment, we have the potential of actually, um, you know, affecting our serotonin levels. And that's something we should be considering uh, that uh, how we see the world around us, how we, you know, how, what our interpretation is 
of the life we are living uh, is affected by the chemistry of our thought process. So our mood is affected by what is going on in the gut. Now, much has been written. We wrote a book. Or I didn't write it. No, actually, I, I edited a book called The Microbiome in the Brain, where I, I have chapters written by leaders from around the world. And, uh, but we made it very clear that there's a real underpinning of neurologic disease based upon changes in the gut. And we would expect that. We know that, for example, there are dramatic changes that are seen in the gut that correlate with type 2 diabetes. And we know that type 2 diabetes, as a diagnosis, is associated with about a fourfold increased risk of an incurable disease called Alzheimer's. So these connections become very, very important. Uh, we know that uh, significant changes in the array, diversity, and functionality of the gut bacteria have been correlated with mood issues like depression and anxiety. So once again, uh, if we are to believe that chemistry might be playing a role, uh, then we need to do everything we can to optimize the situation such that that chemistry is improved. And again, that chemistry gets back to uh, significantly to the, what the gut bacteria are doing for two important reasons. Reason number one, they are the arbiters of the level of inflammation throughout the body, and that affects neurochemistry. And number two, they are directly involved in the manufacturing of those very chemicals that nuance how we see the world around us. So uh, it, it becomes very important then to consider what we eat because, you know, you say to a woman who's pregnant, well, you have to be careful now, you're eating for two. Well, mm -hmm. everybody is eating for, you know, what, 100 trillion. So <laughs> they eat what we eat, you know? And uh, so I think when, when we consider that, we're less likely to eat the types of garbage that you alluded to earlier that are so common in our world today. And recognize if you want to be healthy, job one is nurture your gut bacteria. So, you know, it's really interesting. Um, this is an extreme example of how this happens. But, you know, what we put in our mouths every day, everything we put on the end of our fork is, is what you're talking about. And it matters. Um, and here's an extreme example. So, um, you know, we've had this crazy period in history right now. And um, I thought I had COVID. I didn't. I had a sinus infection followed by COVID crazy. Um, so I thought I was going to get out of it. Everyone else in my family had it. I didn't. I'm superwoman. So I thought, anyways, long story short, I was taking some antibiotics and I, at the same time, we happened to be in Naples around, you know, just around that time. I had taken some antibiotics. We were in Naples, had all this amazing testing done at Fountain Life. It was awesome. And some of the things I had been worried about because of my past health history actually were really good, probably because of the way that we live our lifestyle. The thing that was not good, um, my my gut flora, my, my microbiome was not good. And I'm like, wait, what? I was so disappointed. That was the one thing that wasn't good. And then it's because of these antibiotics, I'm certain of Right, it. right. So you had taken the antibiotics. That makes right. sense. I mean, uh, we need so, to look on antibiotics as weapons of mass microbial right. destruction. And um, so it was really interesting, though, to see that because it was like, it was like an extreme example of how fast you can do that. Food is the oh, slower yes, very, example. Very, very. The good news is, uh, Tana, that you can, you can reconstitute your gut bacteria within a matter of three or four days, according to a work from uh, uh, Dr. David uh, Larry at, um, at Harvard. So you can, you can get it back. And uh, it it's, should be considered uh, you know, recoverable and temporary. The, the problem is the overusage of antibiotics. I mean, you know, kids, uh, get a sore throat or a cold and immediately uh you know parents are reaching for the the red liquid on that the teaspoon yeah right and and then keep it in the refrigerator for the next time yeah. and you know kids get colds and sniffles those are caused by viruses why do they need an antibacterial antibiotic it's like doing an appendectomy for a, a sore shoulder Right. So it's, it's the wrong thing. And, uh, and interesting well, and we do them a disservice because now we sort of wipe out their, their ability to, you know, build their immune system. So it's, right. we need to let them build some natural immunity. That's true. And uh, allowing them, you know, I, I'll tell you an interesting story. Years ago, our daughter got an ear infection and uh, we took her to a pediatrician 
and he wrote the prescription for her, you know, amoxicillin liquid, take, take her home, give it to her for her ear infection. And my wife said, you know, do you really want to do that? And this was way before the microbiome days. And I said, yeah, I mean, she'll get a perforation and then uh, it, it'll be the end of the world, you know? And uh, she said, can we just not give the antibiotic for a day or two and, and let's just see what happens? And I kicked and screamed, but we held off and incredibly, incredibly, her ear got better. <laughs> it would have anyway, right? And it was a very important lesson. So this incredible overusage of broad spectrum antibiotics mm -hmm. is is really, I think, responsible for a lot more illness than we give it credit for, like immune dysfunction and like uh, the changes in the gut bacteria that lead to things like diabetes. We know that antibiotic expo exposure in one of the Scandinavian countries, there was a very extensive research uh, that looked at antibiotic exposure and cross-referenced it with diabetes and found a significant increased risk of uh, diabetes in people taking uh, antibiotics and breast cancer that's as well. That's crazy. And breast cancer as well, yeah. In fact, that's in the book, uh, Brain Maker, because I know you'd have interest in looking at that. So uh, who knew? And, you know, it's not, I'm not saying that the antibiotics themselves led to breast cancer, but there was a correlation between usage of antibiotics and risk for developing breast cancer. My vote would be that likely it was on the basis of changes in the gut bacteria the gut. and as such immune competence that would have otherwise detected cancer early and helped the body rid itself. But that's speculation, of course, but I'm entitled to speculate from time to time. <laughs> well, and to circle back to our original conversation, I want to be respectful of your time. But what, what oh. gluten does is it damages the gut lining. It causes permeability. It damages the gut lining. And when you do that... Um, anytime you do that, you're going to cause problem with your microbiome. Is that fair to say? That's correct. Uh, it's going to affect the microbiome directly. Uh, and it's going to increase permeability. And, and the permeability issue uh, allows certain things in the gut to make their way into the peripheral, uh, rather systemic circulation and challenges the immune system. One of the biggest uh, players that we measure is something called LPS, lipopolysaccharide. That's actually the covering over what are called the gram-negative organisms. They have this fat uh, um, and sugar protein. Uh, it's, it's actually fat and sugar covering uh, over their bodies, the little bacteria. And that makes its way across the, the gut lining and then is powerfully aggressive uh, in terms of stimulating the immune system. So we can measure uh, LPS levels uh, or antibodies that our bodies will create against LPS, LPS antibodies. And interestingly, we see that with, as a marker of gut permeability, we see high levels of LPS. It got across the gut line, tells us the gut is permeable. And we see very high levels of this LPS, another, in other words, mentioning uh, that it indicating gut permeability in major depression in Lou Gehrig's disease, and it in fact correlates the level of LPS, i.e. gut permeability, correlates with the severity of ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. We see it in autism and in Alzheimer's as well. And so it's very good evidence that there is at least a correlation then between the gut permeability and these diseases. Now, one could say, well, maybe uh, the disease is causing the gut permeability. I, I, I whatever. I, I know I have to accept that as a possibility. I don't really gravitate towards that. Uh, but, you know, to be fair, these are, this is a correlation uh, finding, not a causation uh, finding. Somebody is asking, uh, please do a session on ALS. Somebody's asking about your uh, book, The Relentless Courage of a Scared Child. I just thought I'd throw the name out there for whoever asked that question. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, I've, I see all kinds of questions here. And I would love to do another live chat with you at some point on your newest book. Um, I just think it's, it's a great book, Drop Acid. Um, great title, by the way. Just great title. Um, I have to so tell you, to I, I'm going out in a couple of weeks to England to give a series of lectures. And they, you know, they love the topic, but they were not, they said, we're going to have to kind of tone down so it's the role of uric acid in metabolic disease. They didn't. Oh, they I think it's hilarious. You know, 
just it's sketchy. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. So um, I would love to do um, another live. Talk. I've got we've got so many questions here. I could keep you on all day, but I want to be respectful of your. Sure, I have. Uh, uh, 20 minutes, I have another uh, interview. So yeah, absolutely. So um, but yeah, so it's like stay. <laughs> um, yeah, so we'll we'll do another one another time. But you I'm so grateful to you. Um, because I know, you know, it's, it's easy for me to throw this stuff out there, people get really upset. And so I'm like, you know, I'm gonna have the person that is the authority on this. And I just so appreciate your time. And um, well, I'm excited just... about you guys coming to Florida too. That's really, really great. So, oh, me too. And I can't wait. You were not there when we were there last time. So I'm looking forward to when we can finally get together. So you bet. Make it happen. All right. Good to see you. Give my love to your husband as well. And we'll talk soon. Thank you so much, Dr. Perlmutter. Right. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.